Revelation chapter 7, we're going to read the whole chapter. I'll start reading at verse number 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Remember, chapter 6 ended with the men on earth hiding in the caves and in the mountains, the rocks and mountains, calling for them to hide on them, to, to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the Lamb, because the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? But now chapter 7 gives us a, a reprieve, if you will, as we start chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that is before us this morning as we think of these ones that have found safety in the storm, that have found a shelter, a place of refuge, a place that it was safe underneath thy wings, Lord. I pray, Lord, this morning that if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that's never come to put their faith and trust in him, I pray that this morning as we see these ones that are saved even in the great tribulation period, I pray, Lord, that you help that one to see their need to be saved and put their faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. When the Nazis were blitzing, blitzing the city of London in the late 1940, I'm told that in London they quickly set up an emergency system of air raid sirens and bomb shelters. Children were later sent away to safety in other towns but before that could be organized, children and adults alike had to endure the terrifying screams of the falling bombs and the roar of planes overhead 
and the staccato bursts of anti-aircraft gunfire and the booming explosions of bombs destroying London targets. And one little girl was returning home from school when suddenly the siren sounded. She knew what to do because she had done it many times before. She dropped her books and ran headlong towards her home. Nazi planes buzzed low over the city. Royal Air Force gunfire shattered the air. A bomb exploded a block away. And when she arrived home, her frantic father scooped her up and rushed her to the nearest shelter. There they huddled in the darkness with other families as the war raged outside. And they say the little girl clung to her father and said, Daddy, can we please go somewhere where there isn't any sky? She wanted to go somewhere where it was safe. Is there any place that we can hide? In our text, I'm reminded of what happened last week in our text. It closed with the day of the wrath of God. It closed with men calling for the hills and the rocks to fall on them, to hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the face of the Lamb. It closed with men looking for a place of shelter, a place of safety. Is there going to be a place of shelter, a place of safety in the great tribulation period? It's the day of wrath. Is there going to be a place where men can hide? This is the day of vengeance. First Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 tells us it's the day when Jesus will return from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day that John the Baptist warned men of when he pleaded with them to flee from the wrath to come. And so in Revelation 6, while well, men are looking for a place to hide, is there a place that it's safe? Well, Revelation chapter 7 tells me there still is a place that you can turn for safety. There still is a rock that you can run to. There still is a place that you can turn to where it's safe that will keep you safe through the storm. It's the same place that it's always been. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. This chapter is a wonderful chapter. In chapter 6, we saw the, six, the first six seals open and the different events happening on the earth. And we saw the wrath of God getting ready to pour out on a Christ-rejecting world. But in this chapter, we see a reprieve where we see souls of men all the world over put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and find protection. This morning, we're going to see those who were saved through that day of wrath. And as we look at this chapter, in the first eight verses, uh, this chapter, as we look at this chapter, it really gives us a reminder of who God is, doesn't it? Reminds us of how great our God is. Reminds us of how good our God is. And so this morning, as we look at this chapter, I'd like for us to remember who God is and what God is for us. And the first thing is that we see in these first eight verses is we see that God is faithful. We see the faithfulness of God. As this text begins, you notice that the Lord seals the 144,000 of the nation of Israel. In verses 1 and 2, we see how uh, these angels are ready with the four corners, standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, ready to execute judgment on this world. <clears throat> but before they can do it, they're told to stop. Just hold on a second. Don't do it yet. Don't do it until we've sealed the servants of our God. And in verse 2, in verse 3, we read of how they seal those servants in their foreheads. They Literally, they put the name of God in their foreheads, it says in Revelation 14. And he says, I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there's 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. These are the same ones mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. Turn there, if you will. Revelation chapter 14, starting at verse number 1. 
And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads, the seal there in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Who are these 144,000? Well, it seems like every cult wants to claim that it's them. (laughs) Every cult wants to say that it's us. No, it's of the nation of Israel. It's 144,000 made up of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And these ones are called in Revelation 14, the the first fruits, uh, the first fruits of the Lamb as he's redeemed them from the earth. Remember, in Revelation 5, he took the book of redemption out of the hand of the Father, and now he has the rights now to kick the squatters off off his inheritance. And as he's taking possession of the earth, the first ones he claims that are there are these 144,000. He says, these are mine. I'll take them. These are my first fruits. They belong to me. And he takes them of the nation of Israel. You say, why does he take them from the nation of Israel? Well, because he's made a promise. That's why. Because he made a promise to their father Abraham many years ago. Because he made a promise to their father Isaac and their father Jacob, telling them that they would possess this land, telling them of their great inheritance, because he made a promise to them. And when God makes a promise, he is always faithful to keep it. When God gives his word, he performs it. He doesn't just throw around promises lightly. He is faithful to keep his word, to keep his promises. And this text is a reminder of how faithful God is. Think of it. Think of how faithful he's been over the years. I mean, let's be honest. Who's kept track of who are the 12 tribes of Israel today? Today, uh, we know people that are Jewish, and they're descendants of Jacob, descendants of Israel. But you know that today, they don't really know what tribe they belong to. Which one of the 12, they couldn't tell you. They're just Jewish. They're descendants of Abraham, descendants of Isaac and Jacob. But, you know, in the Bible times, in Luke chapter 2, when our Savior's born, Anna knows that she's of the tribe of Asher. Paul knew that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Different ones knew what tribes they were from. But today, nobody knows what tribe they're from. But God does. He's been keeping track of them all these years. All these years when different ones have tried to oppose them. All these ones when villain after villain, such as Hitler, and different ones have tried to blot their name from off the earth. God has been faithful. God has preserved them. He has been faithful to his promise. He's been faithful over the years, but also he's faithful in every circumstance. This text reminds me that no matter the situation, God is faithful and he can keep his word. You realize there's no problem too great for God. When God sets his seal on these ones, he's promising to keep them through this tribulation. They're and their inheritance is, they're, they're going to inherit the land with him. And they're going to make, God's going to protect them from the wrath. My thought is, how? I mean, these are dangerous times. Uh, we saw last week the first three horses. Well, first there's the Antichrist. Then the second horse was war. The third horse was famine. The fourth horse was death. And all these different per- the perils and, and, uh, plagues that would come on the children of men. And yet, God's saying, these ones hurt not the earth till I've sealed them. They're protected. I'm going to keep them safe. How? 
How is it? This is a time, yes, God's going to keep them from wrath, but also this is a time when Antichrist is going to be throwing so much hate at them. And yet God's going to keep them safe. How? Because he's able. He's able to keep his promises. He's faithful to keep his promises. Even when it looks bleak, even when the devil's swirling about, you can trust him in every circumstance. He's faithful. He keeps his word. He's faithful over the years. He's faithful in every circumstance. Also, he's faithful to all. Many seem to find fault with this text, and the reason is, is because there's one thing in this text that is very hard to explain, and that's the names that are missing when you read the 12 tribes of Israel. There's all the tribes. There's 12 tribes, except you'll notice that Manasseh, Joseph is divided into two, but it's not divided into Ephraim and Manasseh, it's divided into Joseph and Manasseh. And then dividing Joseph into two makes it so that one of the other tribes is altogether not mentioned at all. And that's the tribe of Dan. You say, where's Dan? Where's Ephraim? I thought you said he was faithful. Obviously, he forgot them. Well, listen, it's really hard to explain why it might be that they were left out of this. Many, I think the most the, the most biblical answer would be that in the Old Testament times, uh, it was Dan and Ephraim where those golden altars were, where they led the nation to idolatry. Dan, especially in the book of Judges, was the first one to go into idolatry, and God spoke of repercussions for that, and maybe that's what this is. They have to face the tribulation without any of their tribes sealed. But I can tell you this, when God divides the inheritance to the children of Israel as he starts his kingdom. They're there. Dan and Ephraim are there. When, Ephraim, or when Ezekiel foresaw the, it was the nation of Israel in the millennial kingdom, there's a lot for Dan and there's a lot for Ephraim. They're both mentioned in Ezekiel. And so God is faithful to all his people. He can be trusted. He keeps his promises. He seals 144,000 of the nation of Israel because he made a promise to Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And just by the way, this isn't all of the nation of Israel that's going to enter the kingdom at the end of the tribulation. These are just the ones that are sealed. And uh, in Revelation, of course, there's going to be a great time of trouble for the nation of Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. But God is going to, at the end of it, Romans 11 tells us it will be the day when all Israel will be saved because God is faithful to keep his promises. This chapter reminds us of the faithfulness of God. Then also, we see in this chapter the mercy of God. The mercy of God. In verse 9, after this, after the sealing of those 144,000, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Here we have these people with white robes, signifying that they're righteous. They have palms in their hands. Palms signifies victory. It signifies triumph. They're standing there in heaven. They are just as saved as you or me, as those of us who know Christ as our Savior today. And the angel has asked a good question. 
Who are these? Where did they come from? How did they get here? And he gives the answer. There are those which have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these people? Have you thought of that? Who are these ones clothed in white? Some believe that they're the martyrs from all the ages who have given their lives for Christ. But they can't be. Because we've already seen the church wearing their crowns of gold, sitting on their thrones, reigning with Christ, acting as priests with their vials that contain the prayers of the saints. We've already seen the church. Remember Revelation chapter 1? It tells us that he has made us unto God his Father, kings and priests. We are kings and priests, and the kings and priests that we are is seen in Revelation 4 and 5 with the 24 elders made up of every kindred, tribe, and nation as they have their th crowns and they cast them at his feet. They sit on their seats and they're on their thrones and they reign with the Lamb and they have the prayers of the saints in their possession, acting as priests. That's us. We've seen that already. We're the elders in chapters 4 and 5. So who are these? Who are these that are also made up of every nation, every kindred, every people, every tongue? Who are these that are a great number that none can count, robed in white, and the Lord is their shepherd? Well, would you believe me if I told you that they're tribulation saints, that they're ones that put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ during the great tribulation? You say, how's that? How can that be? Uh, how is that possible? How, is that, how can that be true? Well, these are the ones that Daniel spoke of when he said, they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars. In the 70th week of Daniel, many will be turned to righteousness. Perhaps the 144,000, will we call them the witnesses, as they'll tell the world about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Revelation 15 speaks of these ones. Turn to Revelation chapter 15, verse number 2. Revelation 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then it says, And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Who are these saints? They're the ones that overcame. They overcame by putting their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the ones that overcame by washing their robes and making them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're tribulation saints. You say, but how could that be the case? I mean, at the rapture, the church is called home. God's people are called home. So how in the world could there be this many who get saved during that time? He says that there literally is a multitude that no man can number. How is that possible? Well, the Bible speaks of those 144,000 sealed. I believe they'll be witnessing. The Bible speaks of two specific witnesses that will work even signs and wonders. I'm sure they will help. You know, I'm sure that after the rapture, many will be searching. I'm sure that you know, many will be looking to see what happened and looking into the disappearance of all these ones. And, you know, church websites that have gospel messages, they'll still be accessible. I'm sure that different gospel literature, men will be able to lay hold on it and read it and see what it has to say. Bibles will have been left behind for men and women to read. And people will open their eyes and see the reality of God and of Christ. And over that seven-year period, I believe that's what this is. This is a break in the story. This is showing all of them over that seven-year period who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus during that seventh 
70th week of Daniel, this great number of souls will come to know Jesus as their Savior. And say, how? This is the day of wrath. This is the day of judgment. And the martyrs, when they prayed in chapter 6, they did not pray for mercy. They did not pray, Lord, lay not this sin to this charge. They cried out for vengeance. They cried out for wrath. But even in wrath, God remembers mercy. Even in wrath, God is still long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I don't know if these ones have died or if they make it through the tribulation. I'm not sure if this is just a scene of all of them or what. The, what happens next is going to be in Revelation 20 and 21 when the new Jerusalem is set up. Uh, but I, I don't know exactly what, uh, how, they, how, they, how they fare in the tribulation other than to know that they're saved by God's grace. And they'll be there in eternity, led by the Lamb, fed by Him, day by day. All because God is merciful. God is merciful. The gospel is an everlasting gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He rose again the third day, and He ever lives to make intercession for all who come to him by faith. And those saved during the time of tribulation, it says in verse 14, they're saved the same way as you and me. They're saved by the blood of the Lamb. It says, these are they which came out of great tribulation. That doesn't necessarily mean the great tribulation, but certainly it's referring to the troubles they had during that seven-year time. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're saved by his blood. It's not that they were born righteous. It's not that they were born into a Christian home and that made them Christians. It's that they came to the Lord Jesus Christ as poor lost sinners and put their faith and trust in him for salvation. They found forgiveness through his blood. And even during the great day of wrath, God will still be merciful. Now this begs a question. I wonder, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of those that will be deceived and believe a lie, and could be though. Someone says, well, I'm listening to this sermon, and I'm saying, well, you know, I was on the fence, but now that you say that people will be saved after the rapture, I might as well wait and see what happens next. Don't be so foolish. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The fact is, no one is guaranteed tomorrow, and we never know what the next day holds. And we know that at the beginning of the tribulation, there will be lots of things that will cause death, such as war and famine. But God is calling you today to be saved. The fact is, although untold millions will be saved, the Bible does say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that for some have that have not receive the love of the Lord, not receive the gospel, not obeyed it, but instead wanted to keep going on in their sins, because God will give them strong delusion that they believe a lie. They'll believe the devil's lie and follow Antichrist. So don't wait till then to get saved. Get saved today. But in wrath, God remembers mercy. I think of when Noah built the ark. Remember when Noah built the ark and he got on board the ark with all the animals? It was raining so hard yesterday. I really got to stop saying this, but I show up at my grandfather's and I say, man alive, granddad, you haven't seen this kind of rain since you were on that boat. But anyways, <laughs> but uh, I got to stop saying that to him. But think of when Noah built that ark and uh, him and his family got, on, got inside the ark. But remember, the door was too was too big for him to shut. At the very least, we know that no one never closed the door. The Bible says the Lord shut him in. But do you remember that when Noah got on the ark, it wasn't like God closed the door right away. Instead, he kept it open for seven more days. And I think of Noah getting on the ark, and I think, you know, that kind of reminds me of the rapture. We get called up into glory. We're safe in Christ. We're safe in Him. 
but it doesn't mean that God still won't save someone that puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as those 144,000 witness all over the world, as those two witnesses witness in chapter 11, as we see uh, the everlasting gospel get preached to the end of the earth, unlike in Noah's day, this time around, souls will get saved because we see that even in this day, an untold multitude stands before the throne of God, a number which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues with white robes and palms in their hands. And they're standing there saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and onto the Lamb. will be saved just like you and me. And what will we do? The 24 elders and the angels and the four beasts, all we can do is fall down in our faces and worship the Lord for his great grace, for his mercy, and say, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. This chapter reminds us that not only is God faithful, but God is merciful. We see the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God. And then number three, one last thing. We see in this chapter, the goodness of God. Verse 15 to 17, these ones washed in the blood of the lamb. It says, therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them onto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. These ones will serve the lamb before his throne in his temple. And God's going to dwell among them. And these ones, they went through hard times. They went through the tribulation. They're the ones that refuse to take the mark of the beast. Without the mark of the beast, they are unable to buy or sell. They were unable to buy the basic staples of life, such as the food they needed to drink or the eat or the water they needed to drink. On that day, they'll have no more worries like that. Neither will they hunger neither shall they thirst anymore. No more will they bear the burden and heat of the day from the sun on them. But the Lamb of God is going to take care of them. He'll feed them and lead them onto the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All throughout eternity, God's going to show his grace and mercy, his goodness to these people. And you know, God's going to do the same for us. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. God has, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you ask the question, why? Why would he do that? Why would God save sinners like you and me? Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, in eternity, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards you through Christ Jesus. Why does God save us? So that through all eternity, he can be good to us. He saves them so he can be good to them. He saved you so that he can be good to you. I wonder, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? John the Baptist was the messenger who said, flee from the wrath to come. Find the place where it's safe. Get out of harm's way. Where is it that it's safe? Where is a place that you can hide? It's the same place it's always been. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him, and you can find shelter from the storm. I wonder today, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you done what these ones did? Washed your garments and made them white 
in the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text. Lord, it's such an encouraging thought to think that even during the great tribulation, there will be more souls saved in that day than, uh, than we can count, Lord. And it's so encouraging to know that even in wrath, you remember mercy and that you're always working for the salvation of souls. I pray, Lord, that we'll make that our priority, that we'll strive to see men and women come to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, this morning that if there is someone that's never been saved, never put their trust in Jesus, I pray that they'll be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to give you the opportunity this morning to respond. Maybe there's someone that's not saved, someone that's never put their trust in Jesus and wants to be saved. Would you just raise your hand? I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved today and no one at all. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we've had in your word. I pray that now you'll bless in this closing song. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.